but this is Antoinette Cristoval, Office of Finance, and with me today is Ed Cabrera, the Assistant Director of Finance. Um, the report uh, that we were required to, re to report back to the committee on is really addressing the fiscal impact of amending the new business exemption that was recently approved by the Mayor and Council uh, back in uh, June of 2010. And basically what the amendment uh, requests is that a business that establishes a fixed location within the city and is not owned in part, in whole or part, by a person that was engaged in business in an existing fixed location in the city in the immediate preceding tax year would qualify for the new business exemption. Um, so what the Office of Finance was charged with is to uh, address the fiscal impact. And so our report basically uh, touches on that. Uh, basically what we indicate is that the amount of the reduction to the business tax and the amount of offsetting increased revenues uh, from this change is unknown. Um, what we can state is uh, the number of businesses that are currently uh, on the city's tax rolls and the, the number that are currently outside of the city that would qualify for the amendment. Um, what we indicate is that uh, there are 31,957 businesses that are currently outside of the city who are engaged in the city of LA and are currently paying taxes uh, who would qualify. They currently pay about 35.3 million <coughs> annually in taxes. Uh, but what we can say based on uh, historical uh, information that uh, since 1997, 56 former out-of-city businesses relocated that were doing business in the city actually relocated and established a fixed location. So uh, that was a very small percentage and the tax that they uh, uh, paid uh, for 2010 was under a uh, million dollars is 482,000. Um, what we can also report, and we did m mention previously when the amendment uh, back in June uh, was uh, before your committee and council, is that um, 45, about 45 new businesses with gross receipts over 500,000 registered each year with the city for the past three year, fiscal years, and the average tax that they paid was uh, around 273,000. We can say with the uh, with this particular amendment, uh, with a business who is currently outside of the city who relocates into the city of LA, and is uh, that they would really their the tax base would be much larger in terms of what, what would be considered taxable. So there is a potential for additional business taxes should this uh, amendment goes forward. Um, also, these businesses uh, may be subject to other taxes uh, within the city, such as the utility users' taxes, their telephone, electric, and the like uh, taxes, as well as uh, sales tax revenue uh, based on purchases and expenditures that are made within the city, as well as retail sales, equipment, and car leases. Um, I did mention uh, at, you know, previously that uh, the city of LA does not have very many Fortune 500 companies located in the city. Uh, there are five, and with uh, North Grumman uh, planning to relocate, it will be reduced to four. And um, Mr. Swenson, uh, the uh, professor who actually did the economic analysis on behalf of the mayor's office, previously uh, reported that with the three-year exemption uh, that there's potential for 49,400 new jobs to be added. So we recommend uh, that this be moved forward. We think it's in line with the city policy to attract new businesses into the city of LA. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we can suffice to say that uh, we needed this uh, fix because uh, inadvertently the way uh, the uh, motion was written, the um, the business uh, tax exemption would not be applied to businesses that conducted business but may not be established, an established business in Los Angeles, and they were uh, inadvertently uh, excluded. So uh, this amendment um, uh, changes the definition of new business uh, to include those businesses that have fixed lo uh, an existing fixed location. Um, that we have uh, the ordinances scheduled to be presented to council on December 17th. Um, is there anybody who can, are, are we on schedule for that? I'm sorry, I didn't see you over there. 
Deputy City Attorney Dan Whitley. The ordinance is drafted and it's okay. before council right now. It was prepared last week. It's uh, report number R10-0432. It's scheduled to go forward if, if it goes through this committee. Okay, we have a placeholder on Friday's uh, council meeting for that item, uh, assuming this item passes. We have one card from the public, Malcolm. My name is Mel Cohn. I'm here on behalf of the Business Tax Advisory Committee, BTAC. Our chair and vice chair have business conflicts and are unable to attend today. Um, BTAC supports uh, this concept of this new tax exemption, which we've covered in previous meetings, and we also we also support the correcting amendment. Um, this is a very important credit that we are giving um, we believe that we will be seeing business come in and we will be getting revenue from businesses we don't have um, as the director of finance stated we are looking to get these larger businesses and well on the other side the smaller businesses also it's really an incentive when you can save some dollars which you can put into your business so on behalf of BTEC we support this motion thank you uh, do we have any questions or comments from colleagues on the committee? I just have one question, uh, Officer Finance. The only question that we've been asked about this is that, as you know, many of our businesses uh, will go out of business for a while and come back in. If they go out of business as in a fixed structure in the city and don't do business, say, for a year and go to a new location, are they in line for this subsidy? I would, I would defer to the city attorney. I think that they would be. I think so. Yeah. Is that correct? <clears throat> any, any business that is not conducting business in the city in the preceding tax year would qualify for the exemption. So as long as they didn't conduct business in the entire year prior, okay. then they and would The qualify. example that came to my attention is that uh, one of the things, uh, new car dealerships. And we had one recently that basically, uh, in effect, went out of business while they built a brand new facility. So they didn't base, they didn't do business in the city for a year, but they built a brand new facility. Their original inclination is they wouldn't be eligible. The, the way we would normally interpret this statute is that so long as long as they did not generate gross receipts in the city of Los Angeles for the entire taxable year, okay. we would we would say that they are not they are not operating a business in the city. The way operating a business in the city under our code is defined is generating taxable gross receipts. So it wouldn't make any difference if they stayed at their original location or moved as long as they just did their business. There's, there's two aspects now to this ordinance. It previously was simply just operating a new business and that was generating new receipts. Now we've added the operating a, a new business at a fixed location in the city. So that just operates, a, it just adds a, an additional term. But I'm saying so you still need to generate revenues okay but the key is is that it makes no difference if they are out of business for a year and come back to the existing lo fixed location that doesn't change doesn't, yes so they, they can still be they eligible. still they still need to be generating receipts to be operating a business the receipts the is the big, the big issue I, exactly okay okay uh, hearing no objection that matter is approved and we'll have the ordinance before the council on the 17th <coughs> thank you item number two Item number two, Chief Legislative Analyst to report relative to the job creation tax credit and the business tax structure within the city. Uh, good afternoon, John Wickham with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, uh, this committee and the council approved two motions. Uh, one motion, Garcetti Smith, uh, seeking to create a job creation tax benefit for any new job that's created in the city as well as Motion Parks Gregorian to create a, a job creation tax credit for um, the hiring of employees who are uh, disabled or indigent. Uh, in addition, the Business Tax Advisory Committee recommended and this uh, committee approved that um, a, a job creation tax credit program be evaluated in the RFP 
in the study that um, Office of Finance is conducting on reforming city business tax. Um, it, it, and so the, your instruction was for the CLA to go take a look at the at the proposals and, and come back with an evaluation, just some comments on the structure for such a the, such a program. So we've uh, spoken to city attorney, office of finance, BTAC, and uh, we are recommending that this uh, that certain terms be included in the RFP and in the um, business tax study, so that um, this. Uh, program can be fully evaluated. Some of the key terms um, that we were concerned about is ensuring that there's some kind of a nexus in the city of Los Angeles for the benefit of the hire. So there be some kind of a geographic um, uh, component where either the employee hired is from is a, a resident of the city or the business is located in the city. Um, we also recommend that the benefit uh, studied be $500 per year for each job created with an additional $250 credit for um, uh, employees who qualify as indigent, disabled, veteran, senior, newly graduated, or recently or long-term unemployed. Um, so we recommend that the program have a five-year sunset and that the, um, let's see, other benefits and that the study here um, move forward and do a sensitivity analysis to make sure that the rate that's offered would be appropriate. One of our concerns is that uh, the rate be set in such a way that people will actually want to participate in the program, but not set too high th so that we decimate the business tax revenues. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure where that balance is on the rate. That's why we started at $500. The Office of Finance will be sensitive to that. Exactly. Um, so what, one of the things that we found from Office of Finance data is that uh, 40, 45% of the um, taxpayers currently have a tax liability of $1,000 or less. So um, that's 200,000 businesses. You know, I, I don't think we're going to create 200,000 200, jobs in a year, but that has the potential to significantly affect city business tax revenue. So it, it does need to be very carefully balanced in how this program is created. Um, there were a couple caveats that we had in terms of how this program is set up and whether whether asking that the uh, contractor determine or, or, or provide some information as to whether this is really um, the best benefit to offer. It may be better, uh, you know, some of the uh, BTAC recommendations are to reduce all of the tax rates and it may, may be more effective to simply reduce all of the tax rates on all the tax rate uh, payers um, and have a better or stronger impact on the local economy than providing a, a program like this that has administrative burdens. So we are concerned that the administrative burdens may, may get in the way here. Um, one of the things that state and federal government and the federal government benefit from a job creation tax credit is that the tax credit is against business tax or the, the, the income taxes of the business. So when a business hires a new person, that's somebody who's employed and then starts paying payroll taxes. So for a federal government and the state governments, they, they balance out any tax revenue losses. Whereas on this program, this will reduce our business tax. Um, straight away and there's no compensating tax revenue that we would gain directly as a result of people being employed. So that's that's one of the reasons we're concerned about having a nexus in the city so that if if it's a city resident that's employed we don't get a direct benefit but we get direct indirect benefits from additional sales taxes and and additional business activity in the city. So um, those are some of the issues that need to be evaluated to see if this is really the best fit for um, the program and the, the tax that we have available. Um, the study that will be conducted by the Office of Finance is, is far-reaching. I mean, it's, it's going to be looking at a whole bunch of things, not just the few items we're mentioning here. Yes. So <clears throat> I think there's going to be debate on, on many of the specific items, and uh, I think it's it's far too early to to uh, to assume uh, I I which programs will uh, be ferreted out by the council ultimately uh, for passage <coughs> uh, but I, th I do think it's it's helpful for us to look at all of the items and the issues you raise are, are issues that we need to be sensitive to no question about it um, 
for example, if we, we pass a business tax holiday, um, this wouldn't apply to new businesses because they wouldn't be paying the tax. So, exactly. Uh, there would be no credit for them. But, but I think it's important for us to uh, understand all that and uh, uh, ask that the uh, <coughs> Office of Finance uh, be um, uh, as uh, provide as much information as possible, even even that may reach a little further than than uh, uh, than we might have uh, requested directly. Uh, to, to look at other options. Um, if I may, uh, Ed Cabrera, Assistant Director, Office of Finance. We haven't had a chance to uh, review the CLA report uh, that's before this committee. However, uh, in looking at it very quickly, um, I just wanted to clarify, my understanding is that the recommendation is that the uh, study be uh, tasked to uh, the Business Tax Advisory Committee through the uh, contractor that will be reviewing the other proposals that uh, BTEC have uh, sent forward. So I just want to uh, clarify right. that if that understanding is correct. The, the contract that's, that would be moving forward for the full study, these elements would be studied in Yeah, but that. it's the uh, Office of Finance that defines the scope. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's correct. Exactly. Uh, um, any questions? Let me just add, yeah, just a couple of questions. Is that, uh, and I know this is hasn't been formed up yet, but what what's your perception as to when someone attracts a new employee as to when is the cutoff? Is that during business taxes if they're on the payroll during that time? How do we figure out that they you can count them? Yeah. Um, the best tool that, that seems to be available is the annual um, tax reporting to the state and federal government that the business, that the business um, submits and ensuring that there's a year-over-year -year growth. So you, your 2009 taxes, you showed you had 100 employees. Your 2010 taxes, you show you have 101 employees. And growth, even though it may be multiple people that are in that Ex that additional body yeah and uh, this is the number that BTAC that the, the, the measure that BTAC recommended and in talking to Office of Finance they thought that was really the most effective way and the, the lesser uh, burden on the businesses in terms of retaining data and, and reporting there's a couple of things I'd like to make sure that we concentrate on is that it would appear and I guess going from that USC study that hiring city employees should be city residents should be a priority as opposed to just a company hiring uh, people from a larger region but city residents would appear that you can have more of an opportunity for them to then the money that they receive that they spend in the city you get some of those other revenue streams absolutely that's critical and then the other one is that the uh, uh, in looking at it let's see it was one other is that when we talk about some uh, it would appear that we would think about the city's unemployment rate as being a gauge as to whether this is successful, particularly if we concentrate on hiring city residents. So that's mm -hmm. two things I want to make sure that we plug into the study, to because uh, I know the SC guy that did the analysis talked about how you can generate your own economy if you concentrate on certain area of employment. Exactly. Okay. I did want to ask you if, uh, for a clarification. Um, <clears throat> where it says uh, employees that qualify as indigent, disabled, veteran, senior, newly graduated, or recently long-term unemployed, um, these are these are hard to employ categories, and uh, we're assuming that the unemployment rates are higher, and all that will 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 come out in the analysis, but um, if there's any way to ascertain to what extent the city is providing additional services to these folks, uh, that would be minim uh, minimalized if they had a job, um, that might be very helpful and instructive. So I would ask that, that the Office of Finance make it clear in, in their scope that, uh, that we, we need to understand that um, the benefits that are derived from saving money to the city in that would otherwise be spent on additional services to these categories of people. Mr. Krikorian? Yeah, I don't, I don't mean to belabor the point because I think it's been made, but the, for me the key issue on any uh, 
tax incentive legislation is whether the incentive is at the correct amount to influence behavior. And um, I think part of our, our analysis of this is going to have to uh, make some assumptions looking forward about what, uh, what level will influence behavior. It's hard for me to imagine that an incentive of $500 or, or more is going to influence anybody to hire a new person. And if it doesn't, then that means we're simply giving away money to those who are already hiring anyway. And um, that's bad policy. So we're going to have to figure out a way uh, that we find the sweet spot in what that number should be and uh, some data to demonstrate benefit in economic activity. Uh, we uh, passed a, a similar small business new employee tax incentive at the state level, a $3,000 incentive for new hires. Um, and it is significantly undersubscribed. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we budgeted much more money uh, for this incentive than businesses have taken advantage of, in part, I think, because the number was probably too small to motivate people in this difficult economic time to go out and make that decision. And uh, so it was, was not utilized to the extent that we, we had hoped. So... Um, I would like to see when the analysis comes back that it has, you know, a very thorough discussion of that point. What's the right amount to, to affect behavior? Otherwise, I don't think there's any point in doing it. Exactly. And that's where the question comes then. If, if that number is too high, maybe it's better to reduce the tax rates as they are and you're, you're returning tax benefits to everybody. It's not going to result in this change in behavior on the hiring specifically, but it, uh, it again gets to this broader question of is the city business tax friendly? Is it, is it business friendly? Are we addressing rates in a way that, and, and so that may be the better way to, to re, you know, adjust the business tax program. So. Thank you. Okay, so um, I don't think there's any concerns about moving uh, forward with the CLA's uh, recommendations uh, and the Office of Finance uh, understands uh, their task. Um, we, ha we do have one card, Melcon. I'm Mel Cohn, representing the Business Tax Advisory Committee on this issue. Um, BTAC supports the concept of the job creation credit, and uh, we believe the CLA report really outlines all the issues and has done a good job of approaching them. BTAC's observation is one that these credits want you want to also affect small business, and we believe you have to have simple reporting. Um, we are concerned with the cost of any small business paying for accounting to do this, which we've seen with enterprise zone credits, which get very complex and you have many contractors out there. Um, so we believe that's a very important criteria. Another item that concerns us is compliance on job credits and also what resources the Office of Finance has both in human assets and monetary assets. Um, to be able to handle this program of whether there's enough reward when you look at the <coughs> cost of doing it. And that's why we believe you really have to have a very simple formula for doing it. I appreciate that. Uh, this is going to uh, the Office of Finance, but uh, the study is actually uh, being conducted for BTEC, correct? So uh, you'll have plenty of input uh, yeah, uh, on your end. My final comment. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. BTEC is obviously desires to be included. Um, I believe this is something we should look at and see if it makes sense for the city. Well, you're definitely included. <laughs> you're going to be uh, very heavily involved in the study itself. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so with that, um, we'll move this item forward uh, as recommended uh, with the CLA's uh, recommendations. Um, how many people are here on item number eight, the PLA? 
Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to you as quickly as possible. I do want to approve <coughs> items 6 and 7. Uh, item 6 is a Melrose bid, and item 7 is the Wilshire bid. If there's no objection, I'd like to move those items forward um, uh, as reported uh, on consent. And then, uh, do I have to adjourn the meeting to, um, do I have to adjourn the meeting to uh, no, no. take the supplemental? Okay, so we're okay. Okay, and then I'd like to move to item number eight uh, so that a lot of people can get back to work. <coughs> this is the uh, project labor agreement from the Board of Public Works. Yeah, item number eight is a Board of Public Works report relative to authorisa uh, authorization to negotiate a Department of Public Works project labor agreement and related public infrastructure stabilization ordinance. This uh, item was uh, approved in here in public works with the public works committee uh, that was held on July 7, 2010. Okay, who is uh, testifying on, on this item? Do we have uh, somebody from the Board of Public Works? Good afternoon, Council Member. Uh, John Reamer, the Director of the Bureau of Contract Administration. <laughs> to my left, I have Steve Nutter, the Commissioner of the Board of Public Works, and to my right, Hugo Rossiter, uh, City Attorney's Office. Um, I have the pleasure of presenting before you today for your review the culmination of our efforts to negotiate a Department of Public Works project labor agreement between the Department of Public Works and the LA Orange County Building Construction Trades. Um, on the 14th of April 2010, I was authorized by the Board of Public Works to finalize the negotiations with respect to the Department of Labor Agreement. What you have before you today uh, are two things. A, an ordinance, uh, Public Infrastructure Stabilization Ordinance, that for the city's purpose is going to affirm project labor agreements as the viable means of affecting local hire in the city of Los Angeles. And then you also have the project labor agreement that has been forwarded to you from the department along with the policy that accompanies that to lay out how we plan on utilizing the project labor agreement to carry out all of the language that you have in the ordinance. To give you a brief overview, uh, project labor agreement, we've used that phrase to acronize it being P, partnership, L, leverage, and A, accountability. That frames what you have in the agreement. Under partnership, it's an agreement between the city and the trades um, to make sure that in all of our projects, and I'm going to speak to how many and how long, that we have, we have language that allows for no strike, no slowdown, uh, no disruption of uh, work. Um, there's going to be a referral system in place where the trades serve as a referral agent of record where they're going to provide us a continuous source of skilled workers. There's an opportunity for all contractors to utilize um, core workers, and I'm more than willing to answer that question regarding core worker and how many. Um, we have a 30-20-10 countdown to success with respect to local hire. 30% of all the hours worked on the project, the construction project, are to be worked by men and women that live in the targeted areas as we've identified in the agreement. 20% of all of the Hours work should be worked by apprentices as approved uh, in the agreement uh, under the Joint Labor Management Apprenticeship uh, Program. And of the 20%, 50% of them will be residents in the targeted areas that we've identified in the agreement. And then the 10% will be disadvantaged workers. Those disadvantaged workers are also identified and defined in the agreement. The L with respect to leverage, this is a five-year agreement again, between the department and the trades. It covers 98 projects, which is roughly over $2 billion worth of construction work. Um, the board will have the option to add additional projects under this agreement, and the agreement itself will serve as the, the standard, so all additional projects that are not in the list that we call our, our project uh, list uh, will be added uh, under the agreement, uh, but they will not go to the list. It's going to include, it does include a commitment on the part of the trades to not only develop but to also work to graduate 
uh, local and disadvantaged workers through the apprenticeship program. And the accountability will be the city. We will uh, oversee and monitor um, all of these projects to make sure that we hit the 30, 20, 10 numbers that we have identified. The trades are also uh, going to provide quarterly reports that speak to the retention and graduation rates of the participants in the program. This is a big deal. This is a huge deal. <laughs> what took so long? <laughs> you know what? It, it, it said th things that are worth waiting for sometimes take a long time to get, and I agree with you. It has taken a long time, but I believe we have before you excellent policy that will affect a lot of change in this city, and it will make a huge impact. The partnership is a strong one. We've been doing this now for 11 years, project by project. This is a programmatic project labor agreement. So now we're going to eliminate having to negotiate for each project a PLA, and we're going to have a project labor agreement that we will be able to use for the next five years. So anybody competing for uh, a work on, on these projects, uh, there's essentially a template that they, they have to use uh, in, in their uh, contracts yes, with, sir. with their employees. And so it's going to simplify the administrative process uh, yes. in, a, in a huge way, and that's I, I know that, that that's uh, what you're looking most forward to, particularly uh, in light of all the uh, the cutbacks and the early retirements. And uh, so this is a really a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, let me uh, commend all of you, uh, Mr. Nutter. Did you want to make any comments? No, I, I think um, John Reber said it all very well. <laughs> I, I would only add that I think that a lot of people, including on members of the council and former commissioners have worked hard on this and uh, and I want to give some recognition to them for the product that's brought before you. No, w with that very humble comment uh, from a very humble commissioner, uh, we can uh, move forward on this. Uh, we have many uh, cards. Um, uh, so let me just go through them. Actually, we don't have that many. So let me thank you for not submitting a whole bunch of cards because uh, there's been a lot of work put into this, and I, I think a very, uh, a very good product has resulted. Uh, Robbie Hunter. <laughs> After Robbie, we have Tom Moxley. Yes, uh, Robbie Hunter. I'm a council representative of the LA Orange County Building Trades. And um, I can tell you the, the city have some tough negotiators. Uh, John Reamer, John Reamer had a vision on this thing. It was a little bit different from ours. And he worked it till he got it to where he thought it was the best benefit for everybody. Uh, you know, Steve Nutter and uh, various uh, city uh, representatives uh, worked on this hard and it, it happened over a, a long period uh, you know we've done 19 project labor agreements with the city and uh, and it's it's proven uh, cost efficiency uh, uh, scheduling uh, the amount of uh, city workers uh, recently the the numbers coming in on project labor agreements which there's 55 billion dollars worth here in LA County I've been coming in around 38% LA City residents and 71% county residents, and this this really is uh, using your tax dollars for a, for a stimulus program of your own, not depending on other people. Uh, recently, at the uh, I was at a meeting on the LA Community College on project labor agreements, and I only brought the one copy with me. I didn't mean to pass it out, but uh, there's two numbers here that I've highlighted at the bottom. That uh, I would ask the committee members to run their eye on, and this information was given from LA Community College uh, on their project labor agreement. Uh, the first column that I've highlighted is projected costs of the projects that are in the first column. I think there's nine projects. Projected cost of the engineer was uh, 125 million dollars on, on the projects range between 48 million and one and a half million. Uh, projected cost of the college's engineers was $125 million. Under the project labor agreement with local hire and inclusion of the small business, it came in around uh, $85 million. Uh, the provisions that we have for small business is, uh, are good, and we're looking forward to it. Uh, the apprenticeship 
and uh, the apprenticeship, people from community into the apprenticeship really is a life-changing uh, event. It's not a, it's not a job scheme because it's self-motivated. You go to school, you do the R's, you put the effort in, and you will be a plumber, you'll be an electrician, you'll be an iron worker at the end. But the tax dollars will be going uh, to city residents and uh, the jobs. And, and we think, and, and the efficiency of a project labor agreement speaks for itself, and I thank everyone involved. Thank you very much. Please extend my, my thanks to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to the building uh, trades uh, for particularly for their commitment to the apprenticeship program for local hires and the 30% uh, uh, commitment for uh, local hires in general. Um, the, you know, we're, we're in many respects, we're victims of our own success in Los Angeles, where people have uh, obtained higher paying jobs, then they move out. And, and we have the same problem in our police department and in our fire department. I think, uh, I think our police department, one or the, is it the police department or the fire department? It's 86% of the, the, was at one time, of the yeah. police officers live outside of the city of Los Angeles. And so <coughs> um, so it's not, it, it's not a particular slight on, on the building trades that, that, that uh, uh, people move out of the city. It's, it just speaks to uh, the work that we have to do. So I want to commend you also for, for uh, being tenacious on, on uh, creating uh, positive futures, middle class futures for people who are living in the city of Los Angeles where we have a uh, multitude of, of uh, uh, problems, high unemployment and uh, low skill levels. Uh, and so uh, I think this agreement is going to help uh, quite a bit. So thank, uh, commend, I commend both of you for that. Uh, did you want to say something? Okay. Um, Mr. Moxley? Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Alicon. My name is Tom Moxley, and I am business agent for Iron Workers 433. I'm proud to be the president of the LA Orange County Building and Construction Trades Council. There are community benefits in here. We struggled long and hard, and, and nothing was off the table, and we discussed, I won't say argue, Hugo, discussed uh, <laughs> each of the items and came to resolve and cross the T's and dotted the I's. The community benefits is, is, uh, is great. We don't provide jobs. We provide careers. And unfortunately, in many cities, when people raise their standard of living, they move to better surroundings for them and their families. And that's what we're, we're here to create. We've been doing it. The iron workers have been doing that for over 100 years here in LA. And we continue, uh, plan to continue to do this for another 100 or plus years. And we look forward to this. I'm going to keep it short and from the billing trades. Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. Thank you very much. And uh, of course, the. Um uh, one of the benefits is going to be that the there's not going to be the gamesmanship uh, by the contractors who are bidding uh, to to uh, throw the savings on the backs of the workers, and uh, that's exactly uh, the, I think that's the strength of this agreement that there'll be a consistent pricing, a quality pay for for the workers throughout, and that's that's the greatest benefit. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Marie. I can't read your last name, Marie. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Marie Rumsey here on behalf of Councilwoman Jan Perry. And um, I think we're all very happy to be here today. We started doing this work with John and the Board of Public Works and the Building Trades back in 2006. So this is a long time in um, formation. And I think there's two very good um, documents before you. <coughs> I think the uh, citywide PLA is very fair and balanced. And then the Public Infrastructure Stabilization Ordinance is a strong ordinance that sets out the city's preferences to how we actually achieve local hire on our projects. So we ask for your support and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have no other cards in this matter. Are there any questions? I had a couple. Mr. Parks? Yeah. Let me just ask, uh, John, could you repeat what you said about how uh, jobs get on the existing list? The <clears throat> The list that we have that accompanies the project labor agreement was established in the negotiation process. What we did do is preserve the right of the board to, if there are any projects that come that are not currently on the list, um, they can elect to have those projects, that project, placed on the list or projects. Um, what will happen is a motion will go before the board that will 
give findings that will show just cause to have a project or projects placed under the project labor agreement. We, however, will not have to negotiate again. We will use this current project labor agreement and that project, those projects, will be added under this agreement. And, and you're going to use the same criteria that placed the list together initially? Yes, yes. So for that project, those projects, uh, the 30-2010 will still come into effect the same uh, definition for disadvantaged worker, all of the agreements that we have, the uh, policy that we put in place, all that will still be the same. And my final question now, there's a personnel cost, and where's that source of funds? We are asking for uh, five uh, staff for the Bureau. Um, this is primarily for the local hire component. These will all be direct charges to the project themselves, so they will come from the project funds. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, no questions? Okay, this, uh, <clears throat> the matter before us is to approve the Board of Public Works report and with recommendations as, as were stated by Mr. Reamer. Uh, the city attorney, uh, we have a placeholder on the city council uh, for the city attorney to present the ordinance to the council this Friday on That's December correct. 17th. Um, so our action to approve this today will place the matter on the uh, council agenda this Friday and uh, provide a a Christmas present to all the people who will benefit from this and there will there will be a lot of people who will benefit from this um, so with that uh, hearing no objection I just want to ask one thing uh, it looks like in the notes that it's going to budget personnel what what are the items that are going there I'm sorry please because there's a there, there's the CLA made a recommendation to refer to personnel and uh, budget and finance because there's a potential fiscal impact and there's mm -hmm. also a request for positions. Does that hold up the ordinance at all? Mm -hmm. It might unless it's waived. Okay, we'll waive it from budget. I, but again, you got to get with personnel. Correct. Okay, we uh, we have the uh, we have the placeholder uh, in place, and we will uh, we will. Uh, try to get the chair of the personnel committee to waive it and hopefully we get it on the agenda uh, it's I believe it's on the agenda already it is on the agenda but we we do have to get it waived mm -hmm. uh, from uh, the personnel committee the chair budget has yeah. waived it has to be yeah has it been waived already no not not yet no. okay so uh, that would be mr. Zion correct yeah. the source of funds are coming from the uh, labor force you don't have to, uh, they shouldn't be an issue for budget or personnel yeah, yeah. As soon as it gets me, uh, the, there's a placeholder grade already mm -hmm. for Friday. Okay, but we ha we do have to clarify to make sure that we get Mr. Mr. Uh, Zine to waive it, um, so that we can hear it on on Friday. Uh, I want to be clear. You you're going to be making that request. You want me to call him? What do you want me? To uh, it <laughs> just want to make sure it happens. Uh, it hasn't been referred to uh, personnel yet, so our notes reflect that. Well, that's it's only a recommendation. It's a recommendation by CLA. We could, we could. Okay. How about if we don't, uh, we exclude that recommendation uh, from the uh, recommendations, uh, yeah, uh, and it's waived from budget and finance. So, um, so we are approving the uh, recommendations from the CLA uh, minus the recommendation to send it to uh, the personnel committee, and it is, uh, it will be on the agenda for this Friday. Uh, so, with that, uh, this matter is approved. Okay, now we're back on the regular uh, item number three. Item number three. Yeah. Congratulations, folks. Item number three is an item that was continued from September 14, 2010. It's a city attorney report and ordinance and a communication from BTAC relative to business tax administrative appeals process decision and reclassification. This item was also referred to the Budget and Finance Committee. Okay. It's item three. Excuse me, I'm just catching up a minute here. Okay, there's um, 
Do we have anybody presenting on this? Uh, the city attorney wanted to Deputy present on this? The city attorney, Dan Whitley. We yes. have two matters here. Yes. We have a report on um, the Brown Act uh, consequences of certain uh, recommendations that were made with respect to the makeup of the Board of Review. And then we have a um, amendment to 2116, which is the makeup of the Board of Review, or uh, not the makeup of the Board of Review, it'd be, <coughs> excuse me, I'm suffering from a cold. Uh, from, from uh, it, it, would, it would address what would happen if a Board of Review determination overturns a prior Board of Review determination and would uh, prohibit the um, Office of Finance from collecting taxes when that happens for the period um, up to when the Board of Review determination uh, is made overturning a prior Board of Review determination. Those, those two matters are before the Jobs Committee on this okay. side. Um, there's some conflict uh, with uh, the actions already taken by the Mayor to change the composition of the Board and BTAC's recommendations. Correct. We're going to hear from BTAC uh, representatives in a second. Um, so it's the desire to note and file BTAC's recommendation, uh, I believe. Is that, is that correct? Um, now, I, I'm not understanding uh, number two, request the city attorney to amend the draft ordinance uh, section one. Uh, that's for the other issue. Right. But to include more than one previous BOR determination? The, the way we had drafted the ordinance was that it would apply only if the, only if the taxpayer had, had one previous Board of Review determination, and that was simply a, to make things clear. Um, that, that's, we have no legal reason that needs to be in the ordinance, and BTAC has an issue with that. We can amend this amendment. And, and, and remove that that specification. Well, does it make any sense to, to include more than one previous board well, this, determination? This is the issue. Um, we're, th this this um, proposal uh, was made before BTAC even existed, and it was created to address a specific taxpayer that had raised this issue with with council, and it dealt with the taxpayer that had one board of review determination and then had it o overturned later by a by a subsequent board of review. And the period of time was about 15 years between these two Board of Review determinations. Um, the issue we were trying to address is this ordinance could be in effect for you know, the next 100 years. And so if we're dealing with taxpayers that have multiple Board of Review determinations, we could have, a class, we could have one Board of Review determination that addresses one classification, and another Board of Review determination dealing with another type of classification, and then you know, it, it, things could get complicated to, just to keep track of, let alone you know, follow. Um, and so that, that's why we wanted to make things clear so that it was easy to follow and administer. But we understand BTAC's concern that they want to have the, this policy affect as many taxpayers as, as possible. Um, and so there's, there's no legal reason this, this is required. It was simply a matter of administrative convenience and keeping the ordinance clear and have the policy apply in as clear a manner as, as possible. I just want to be clear on what, what actions we are approving today. Um, we have a, a draft amendment to 2116I. What, what the amendment as drafted would do is say that if there's a Board of Review determination dealing with classification that overturns a prior Board of Review determination dealing with classification, where the Office of Finance had a complete opportunity to review the taxpayer's records, there was no obfuscation or interference with the taxpayer. The taxpayer completely reported their gross receipts in both circumstances. Um, then the Office of Finance would not collect the back taxes that were owed for the, for the second Board of Review determination. Okay, so your current language allows for that? That's what the current language does. Okay. Uh, BTAC um, would like the... Um, or the, the, this, this ordinance to apply in such a manner that it would apply to all Board of Review determinations, not just to a taxpayer that only has one prior Board of Review determination. They would also like this to apply to, uh, when I say all Board of Review determinations, to all issues that go toward, toward the Board of Review, not just issues dealing with classification. So just to back up a second, our, our, our business tax system applies to revenue streams, and they're classified in a, various, in, in a manner 
So some, some taxpayers are classified as multimedia, some as retail, some as professions and occupations. Some taxpayers have multiple classifications. Um, but there's other issues that come up. Um, one of the issues that could come up is how much of the taxpayer's revenue should be apportioned to the city of Los Angeles. They might have revenue that comes from other cities or even other states. One issue that might come up is whether a certain amount of money they have in their accounts is revenue at all or whether it's something else, whether they've just received um, uh, money that's supposed to be someone else's or whether it's, it's a payment for expenses or something like that. An issue could come up whether that the assessment was made outside of the statute of limitations. A taxpayer could challenge um, an issue on equal protection or other constitutional grounds. There's, there's lots of things that the Board of Review looks at. Um, this passed through Jobs Committee and Council simply dealing with classification, and that's the only issue that Office of Finance and the CLA addressed and analyzed. Okay, okay. So, um, so you're recommending we move forward on the classification issue, uh, and uh, we can defer the other issues uh, and work with BTEC uh, uh, or not <laughs> as oh. we move forward. <laughs> yeah. But uh, at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Mel Cohen and uh, uh, Michael Banner to step forward. Councilman, there's also another report, a city attorney report, that we're recommending that be received and um, noted and filed as well. Um, yeah, the recommendation uh, by the city attorney is to note and file uh, the uh, section dealing with the board issue, the composition of the board, uh, because the mayor has changed the composition, although we understand that uh, BTEC uh, would like it changed differently. Um, it is a change, and uh, frankly, it would be my inclination to to allow the, the mayor's change to s stand until it becomes a problem, and then we'll take a look at it. Um, but on the other issue, um, uh, I'd like to hear from, well, on either issue, actually. Mr. Cohn? Um, Mel Cohn, Business Tax Advisory Committee member. And Michael. Uh, Michael Banner, Business Tax Advisory Committee member. Um, this has been a while since this has been in review by the city attorney's office the the concept of not reversing prior decisions if circumstances remain the same came about during BTAC first three months where we had what we call a salt forum it was state and, state and local tax professionals and we were talking about issues they had and this is where this generated um, the concept of BTAC is to be able to have the city business tax code be consistent, be transparent, be fair, and being able to audit and give the taxpayers rights. What we believe that is on the table is just dealing with one area, which is classification. We believe that this ordinance for not reversing a prior BOR decision if circumstances did not change, should be applied to any BOR action. And we feel very strongly about it because that was the concept in which we originally brought this up. Um, you may remember that our original concept was also to include this to audit findings because this is similar to the Board of Equalization rule um, where if you have a matter, you've been audited, nothing's changed, um, and they find another audit fighting for that audit period, you wouldn't have an assessment. However, going forward, because circumstances have changed, obviously you would. So I, I think what we're saying is, because we're just applying this to BOR decisions, um, we believe it should encompass all BOR decisions rather than just be isolated to classification. Classification's an issue, apportionment's an issue, and so sitting here today, and we have really not had a chance, BTAC, to discuss this further amongst ourselves on what our feeling is with the city attorney. Michael? I, I think that um, expanding this goes to the heart of fairness and simplicity. That if we have a chance to fix it now, we fix it across the board for, for all these areas. And I was actually struck by some of the uh, email comments that on 
on the surface this looks like a very simplistic issue <laughs> but I think uh, the city attorney has just given you a number of iterations of what could possibly happen and so as a business owner and a taxpayer that has to sit through this who may not necessarily have the ability to have expensive you know uh, advice from uh, attorneys or other tax professionals would probably really think that having certainty that I've done this we've made the decision and I live up to my end of the, the bargain the expectation of the city would live up to any of the bargain. <laughs> so I, I come down on the side of that this should be, it just should be fair. And opening issues back up and going over and over again when you think you've done your best to comply is really a, a unfair to the taxpayer. Well, okay. Um, uh, I'd like to express my inclinations uh, and, and, and then uh, get your input as to how you might want us to pr proceed. And I'm speaking to to the BTAC uh, committee members, um, uh, first of all, on the on the issue of, uh, of the board composition, it's my inclination to uh, to um, to note and file uh, that recommendation because the mayor has changed the composition. Although it's not what was requested, uh, out of respect for for the mayor, uh, I want to see how his uh, new composition performs. And, and if there are issues, we'll, we'll take it up. Uh, at, uh, we'll be happy to take it up at a later time. Um, on the issue of the uh, previous BOR determinations, uh, it, it's now. I just have one clarification. If if a BOR has uh, has made two determinations, for example, um, and then there's a subsequent. So let's say they've already done two determinations, and then subsequent to this meeting, there's there's another determination. Uh, but we passed this, so it would which which determination would it fall back to? Well, as drafted, <laughs> as as we've drafted it, it was currently before the jobs committee. This wouldn't apply at all. This only applies if the taxpayer only has one prior determination. Assuming we eliminate if you the eliminate one. that. That's why we were looking for a clarity in this ordinance because we're not sure what would happen then. Is we'll have multiple determinations. We assume it would be the most recent one, but the tax uh, that that was one of the issues we were dealing with because the when when this came up and it, not to you know not to denigrate what BTAC is saying. This this arose before BTAC was formed, and it dealt with the taxpayer that only had one classification, and it's something we can deal with. It only had one prior board of review determination. That's something we can deal with. Yeah, hey, uh, I, 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 uh, I got the I got the issue. Into, when we get into I got the issue. All I'm trying to figure out is, yeah, if if there were multiple determinations, which one would apply? And that's something we're trying to deal. We'd have to deal with that. And so, is there a have, recommendation with regard to that? Well. The, 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 the cheapest one, right? <laughs> well, one thing, are you talking about issues, multiple BOR decisions on the same issue or multiple issues in the BOR? If, I'm only talking about classifications. Um, but we, and, and understand that we, that we have not done our due diligence with regard to any other matter. Uh, the other question I would raise to you, and you you can uh, think about this as you're uh, uh, preparing your uh, response to my first question, um, we can we can send this forward uh, and do another ordinance later, <laughs> or we can hold the whole thing and try to try to uh, seek a broader fix. Uh, but um, our response would be: we'd like to view this in its entirety again. And so you no, want to delay the matter now? Yeah, I, I, I warn you that that um, uh, how long did it take us to get here? Was about six months? Well, but or longer? I, I think some of that was miscommunication, though. Um, oh. I, I think we can deal with some of these issues. Okay, so quickly. so uh, how many other issues are you said audits? What other? How many other categories Audits are there? Audits taken off the table. Well, I, I, unfortunately, it's kind of hard to tell. We'll, we'll have to go back to Office of Finance and get a more complete look at what issues come up at Board of Review. I'm just yeah. thinking of things that I, I'm aware of that I've dealt See, with. See, when you say across the board, it's, it's sort of ambiguous. We don't know <laughs> any, what kind any of deal. BOR decision, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah. where the facts have not changed, we believe that they shouldn't change it for any BOR decision, whatever yeah. that may be. 
because it's consistent. Well, um, I, and I don't know what the ramifications of that are. I don't know what uh, what the implications are. Um, so we would have to we would have to have a, a Department of Finance come back and tell us uh, all the various decisions that would mm -hmm. fall into that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> but if 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 I'm hearing a consistent message from BTAC, and I got two members here, so as far as I'm concerned, that's a consistent message mm -hmm. is that you would rather we like, hold. We like to try to fix this. You'd rather hold the entire matter um, rather than a small fix. <clears throat> uh, but I, I do want to uh, give you warning that that, <coughs> and I, I believe the Office of Finance will tell you that each decision has different uh, different issues, and so. Mm -hmm. Uh, we think we've nailed this one <laughs> on the classification in a way that uh, should be supported by BTAC. We can't guarantee uh, how the other minor, uh, matters might go. But, but I'm happy to take a look at it that way if you want. Give us 10 seconds. <laughs> in the meantime, uh, Office of Finance. Um, Ed Cabrera, Office of Finance. Uh, uh, we just wanted to uh, uh, state uh, for the record that we do concur with the city attorney report uh, regarding uh, the uh, uh, nature of BOR decisions on classification and classification only. We also concur with the uh, city attorney's uh, comments today that um, the uh, nature of a taxpayer's business tax um, activity could change, which doesn't result from a material change in their method of operations, but just the the day-to-day -day nature of how uh, businesses conduct uh, their sales. Uh, simply, uh, a different mix of uh, customer could result in a different um, audit finding, uh, not through any change in uh, city policy, but simply based on the taxability of certain revenue streams. So. Uh, Office of Finance uh, um, completely agrees with the report um, that city attorney has provided and also their um, uh, cause for concern uh, should this be extended beyond classification issues. Okay, BTEC. I would just have one basic question. What makes classifications issue so simple to reach this conclusion? Everything else sounds like it's Well, but that wasn't my question. <laughs> that wasn't my question, and I'm not even going to allow a response. Okay. Uh, the, the question is, whether you want us to hold this entire matter uh, or move forward with an ordinance relative to classification. We should hold it. Yeah. We'd hold it. We'll hold okay. It. Uh, and uh, then uh, I don't think Mr. Kukorian has any objection <laughs> to that. <laughs> and and I, I don't either. So then the instruction would be to uh, ask the Office of Finance with the assistance of the CAO uh, and the, the city attorney to report back on the impact of ex uh, expanding the draft ordinance to include uh, uh, all or other uh, BOR uh, decisions. Um, what kind of time frame would you like on that? Well, uh, um, with, with all due respect, uh, Chair, the Office of Finance has already submitted a report uh, on this matter uh, dating back to October of 2009. We'd be more than happy to recirculate that. Well, if, if, if that's the case, then um, we just need to agendize it. So, so does it include all BOR decisions? We do address that, uh, uh, but we could, we could also provide information in terms of the types of of uh, How specific is it? Is it just a broad <laughs> statement that you don't like it? Or oh, it no, no, no. <laughs> uh, no, well, we, we, we will redistribute the report. We'll provide it to... Did, to did the report go into some detail on, on those other decisions? Uh, we touched on our concerns and in potential impact in terms okay, of... Okay, so you think in 30 days... Uh, we would ask we would ask for additional time just because of the fact that we're entering into our of course okay. renewal season. Uh, we would ask for sixty days. Sixty days would be fine, uh, and uh, and then I would ask my staff to make sure I get a copy of the the report. We'll but um, my uh, my hunch is that it's not going to be the kind of detail that we would we would need. We actually have conducted some analysis okay. that we've already provided to uh, the business tax advisory committee on the types of issues, uh, the the number of uh, uh, instances of those issues that have gone to okay. uh, both the first and second level uh, appeal process. So okay. that information is readily available. Okay, but it may not be in the report that okay. 
Okay, great. Then, uh, then that would be the order. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we're continuing the whole item. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we're continuing the whole matter uh, and asking Department of Finance uh, to report back uh, with the uh, with the assistance of the CAO and uh, the City Attorney uh, on the impact of expanding the draft ordinance to include all BOR decisions. Got it. Um, uh, and uh, to recirculate their uh, their previous report on on that matter. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one other issue, the uh, BOR composition we'd like to comment on. Oh, pl I'm sorry, please. Yeah. Um, BTEC does not want to violate the Brown Act, and uh, we, be we believe that um, the main issue with the co composition is the qualifications of the people being appointed, and that's just as important to us mm -hmm. as the composition so we would the, what we have mentioned in our uh, memo and our opinion on composition we like just to have it to be considered but nothing we want to do is to disturb the Brown Act in this process I don't I don't think we have any issue with the Brown Act um, well based on the city attorney's report the issue with my phone I'm sorry. Um, no, uh, it, it was all it was all part of the same item. It's a separate report that the city attorney prepared to respond to some questions regarding the Brown Act. Mm -hmm. there, there were some just to back up, Councilman. There, there yeah. were some proposals that had been made that would potentially violate the Brown Act if that was how the composition of the Board of Review was going to be changed, and that's what our report addresses. Um, so some, some of the potential changes to the Board of Review would have the City Council appoint members or approve members to the Board of Review, and that has Brown Act implications that would turn the Board of Review from its current advisory role to a legislative body, which would subject it to the Brown Act, oh, make see. it an open meeting, right. um, subject taxpayers to, uh, they would no longer <coughs> have private information, they have public information, and uh, BTAC is just pointing out that they do not want that to happen. But oh, is that what, is it, okay. Yes, we, oh, we were surprised. I'm sorry, Mel. I want to thank Dan for <laughs> pointing this out to us. But we had uh, written a letter back in May regarding experience is very important. And also, just as a side light, we'd recommend staggered terms so you'd have continuing change of the BOR. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll, I'll tell you, why don't we just continue the whole, the whole thing and... Um, including uh, that section, we'll, we'll be happy to take another look at it. Uh, and maybe we can communicate uh, with the mayor's office uh, to try and get a response from them since they uh, have changed the composition. And and, uh, and uh, I'd like for them to weigh in. I, I You know, the mayor is making an effort to improve uh, the decision making and, and you know, I just want to respect that. <coughs> uh, until it becomes a problem. And I don't know whether it has or not, but uh, uh, I haven't heard of anything directly, so uh, I will write a letter to the mayor's office asking for uh, them to respond, and hopefully we'll get that uh, for uh, the 60-day report. Okay? Good. Thank you much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, and have a happy holiday. Same to you. Uh, item number four. Item number four is a motion by Council Members Alarcon and uh, Parks relative to identifying funding to support the Greater Los Angeles Earned Income Tax Credit Campaign. This item was also referred to the Housing Community and Economic Development Committee. Okay, I don't have any cards on this item. Uh, Mr. Corian, do you have any questions? This is simply to take $50,000 in savings from uh, last year's CDBG funds um, and uh, uh, allocate it for the purpose of uh, of uh, <coughs> using it for the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit campaign. Uh, so, um, so CDD is requesting an amendment to the motion uh, to, let's see, number two in the motion should be amended as follows. Uh, uh, after trust fund number 424 uh, from F account F302, uh, title CD, uh, CBDO HSDS uh, and amount 50,000 
uh, to uh, account G727 uh, EITC campaign 50,000. Um, and we have no objection to that, so uh, that would be the order. Okay, item number five. Item number five is a motion by Council Members Koretz and Han relative to requesting the City Attorney with the assistance of the Chief Legislative Analyst to prepare and present an ordinance in 90 days which would require the re recalling of any hotel workers laid off because of construction or remodeling at the hotel in which they were employed. This item was also referred to the Trade, Commerce and Tourism Committee. Okay, do we have uh, a member of uh, Mr. Koretz's staff. Uh, Kayan Kayani? I hope yeah. I said that right. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilman Kretz couldn't be here today uh, due to illness, so I'm speaking on his behalf. Uh, this item came before the TCT committee, I believe, uh, a month or so ago, and uh, Councilwoman Han's motion went forth to council where there was a debate in chambers about the nature of the motion, and there were there was some uh, discussion about or, or and um, concern about it at that time councilmember parks offered a um, amending motion which would basically um, have the CLA CAO do a economic impact analysis on on councilmember Hans motion and then also have the city attorney um, look at the issue in terms of its legality whether or not there's a nexus between with what the city was trying to do with the hotels and you know whether or not the city could do it and where councilmember Kretz here today he would ask um, for a similar motion to be made in order to have this item looked at by the CAO CLA and the city attorney um, well uh, we would just concur with the report from trade and commerce Absolutely. Would I that, think there was a little. There is yeah, a, there's a, little a change bit. because okay. the their recommendation um, asked that the Office of Economic Analysis review it. So it would be the CAO and the CLA. Correct. If that's what you. I think the point in council was that, that there is no office to actually do that work. So who would fall on the CLA CAO? I thought we established that. <laughs> I believe that's still um, not established. It's established, but no staff. The funding. Perhaps. <laughs> You're the expert, sir. <laughs> I, I, the uh, obvious irony is uh, is too much for me right now. Correct. Um, okay, then the um, uh, then this committee would recommend. Oh wait, we have other speakers. So uh, the idea would be that this committee recommend that um, uh, that that the CAO and CLA. Uh, uh, prepare analysis uh, to report the fiscal impact of the actions recommended by Councilman Correct. Actually, the, uh, the motion, the verbal motion made by Councilmember Parks, uh, actually uh, encapsulates Councilmember Correct's, um, you know, his ideal sort of motion. But well, was that reflected in the report from Trade and Commerce? No, no because it was made in, in full council, not in committee. We'll, we'll follow up and get the I language. can provide that. It's a different motion. Councilmember Hans' motion had her own uh, Councilmember Parks made a verbal amendment to it. And so we're just simply asking that the same verbal amendment be made to our motion so that it, it, both items would be heard at the same time. I, I believe Councilmember Parks. So I, I have it. a copy of that oh, previous have, verbal okay. motion. So basically it would be to instruct the city administrative officer and the chief legislative analyst to prepare or facilitate a nexus study, an economic analysis, and a determination of whether or not the city should adopt this proposed ordinance, and to request that the city attorney to prepare legal analysis of the proposed ordinance. Correct. Thank you. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And now you can. Okay, then that, that would be our intention, but uh, before we we uh, make that the order. Let's ask uh, Bob Amano. Uh, after Bob, we have Maya Zutler. And after Maya, we have Ann Williams. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, Bob Amano, executive director of the Hotel Association Los Angeles. Uh, happy to be here today. And upon hearing that, we're really? pleased to hear <laughs> that it will be re uh, the reports will be requested. Uh, but we do here, we do want to stress that we sh we do uh, you know oppose the the ordinance in, in the same statements that we made during the in, during chambers uh, the, during the council, last council meeting uh, that it was brought up forward. Uh, 
the hotels as itself would like to be um, considered part of part of what's going on obviously being being participative of of what's going on with this ordinance uh, but we haven't gotten asked yet so if there's any assistance that we need to give then you know give us a call but we do strongly oppose that because you know LA has a reputation of being unfriendly to to potential investors out there and, and you're singling out the hotels now and so what we're doing here was we're eliminating the potential of a new investor coming in and saying hey look you know you got some restrictions here you got some ordinances here that's not going to work out for me so they're going to go look elsewhere so that potential is going it's not going to put any more money into the into the coffers or in ways of revenues or TOTs or any other uh, hospitality taxes that that are assessed but um, we'd like to be you know cooperative you know give us a chance to to make what what we feel is our statements and and I'm sure my colleagues will have have this similar opinion but again we do oppose that the ordinance uh, is, is being looked at in such a way um, and uh, that's uh, where we come from and representing the association thank you uh, and by the way I, I want to point out I was not at the council meeting where this discussion took place so I'm sort of relying on other information here okay. Maya? Thank you. Good afternoon. Maya Zettler on behalf of VICA, Valley Industry and Commerce Association. VICA strongly opposes this ordinance that is before you today. Yes, we agree that a nexus study does need to be completed. However, we anticipate that the nexus study will yield results that will just show that we do not believe that this ordinance is necessary in the city of Los Angeles at this time or any time. Um, the city has been working tirelessly in recent months to try to change its reputation and become more business friendly. We feel we need to continue on this trajectory. We should not move forward with this ordinance. We, do, we feel that this ordinance will just place unnecessary additional burdens on this industry and we don't really see a reason why at this time to introduce such a motion and create such an ordinance. We don't understand which policy goal this is trying to achieve and it'll just perpetuate the stereotype that Los Angeles is not open for business and is not business friendly. We do believe that we need a fiscal study and a legal study and a nexus study and we agree with the verbal motion that was introduced today. However, we just believe that the results will come back and show that this is just not something necessary, especially at this time. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Williams with the Central City Association. The CCA also strongly opposes the motion before you today, which we believe uh, unfairly targets a few hotels. We also believe it's an improper intrusion uh, by the city into private business and uh, what right does the city have to tell businesses who they must offer employment to, uh, particularly when there has been no legal or economic policy foundation established to support moving forward with the drafting of an ordinance. Um, the motion looks to Santa Monica as a template but does not identify any evidence to tell us whether or not this approach has been successful there such that our city with its much bigger uh, hotel industry should uh, embark down that same path. At the very least, we urge you to soften the blow of the bad timing of this effort and continue the item until city staff can make sufficient inquiry uh, into the impact it would have on jobs and business creation and operations. Um, to clarify, I, there needs to be an assessment of the policy on the affected businesses, um, not just on the city budget or, or that, but, but how it would actually impact the business community, which is what I understand the Office of Economic Analysis is supposed to be doing, which is a little different, I think, than typically the CLA or the CAO does. Um, finally, aside from the content of the motion, the proposal sends exactly the wrong message at exactly the wrong time. As, as my um, people before me have said, it tells the invest investment community that LA is not safe for business, and that is already the reputation of LA today and it really is the single biggest barrier to attracting the new investment um, that's the only that is the only way we're going to be able to recover from this um, this recession so we urge you to oppose the motion although we would um, agree with the um, um, amendment hey, let, me, let me ask a question uh, uh, does the Warren Act apply here I mean uh, when when there are layoff uh, conditions uh, the there uh, are certain Warren Act provisions of reporting, but I thought that in the Warren Act uh, that uh, employees had to be uh, returned to their jobs should uh, should they be become available. So I'm I'm a little confused at the discussion here because, um, and, and I could be completely off base. Maybe it doesn't apply to hotel industry or whatever, but uh, but I thought under the Warren Act uh, for large layoffs at least. 
that there was a provision that the workers would get their jobs back if they were back if they were laid off, and then those jobs were recreated. Um, what so, is the reason we don't need that work? so I, I I want to I would like to ask that the uh, uh, the report uh, uh, that. Uh, the action of this committee that is consistent with Mr. Parks uh, add a provision to fully analyze uh, the, the uh, current uh, laws relative to layoff procedures uh, and specifically name the WARN Act uh, to ensure that uh, I, it, the, the purpose of this is, is, is clear and, and you know the, <laughs> what problem do we have? We have a high unemployment rate and when workers are laid off uh, for whatever reason, uh, it exacerbates the existing problem. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not naive about that. Uh, the question is whether or not uh, they are entitled to their jobs back. Uh, whether it's, uh, uh, I, we're sort of, uh, what's that? What's that saying? You can eat like this, or you can eat like this. Um, but you tr try to eat like this if you can, and that means uh, that there may be al there may be provisions in the law to already protect uh, these workers under these kinds of conditions, and then there may be a small segment of hotels <coughs> where uh, that would not apply, depending on, for example, size. I don't know, uh, but I think the the goal is admirable to try and protect uh, these workers' jobs now. I think uh, in 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 one scenario, uh, a business could um, uh, could an investor could come in and say, "We're going to invest in your in your hotel and for whatever share of the business," and uh, and that means reconstruction. The workers get laid off. Uh, they come in. One of their conditions is we don't want a union, uh, and and that I think is is the nut of 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 the uh, of the debate. And, and so we don't need to mince our words. Let's let's uh, deal with with <laughs> what is real. And so I so I think that's where the discussion. Uh, I don't think Mr. Park's motion gets in the way of that debate. In fact, it enhances that debate. So um, so I don't have a problem with moving forward with this. Uh, I understand Mr. Mr. Caretz's sentiments, <coughs> and uh, but I believe it, there may be other protections that have been overlooked. Uh, and so uh, I, I I think uh, we're all right with. Uh, with approving uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the motion that uh, was made verbally by Mr. Parks uh, with the addition that, that the uh, analysis include uh, consideration of the WARN Act or any other layoff procedures that are already uh, in place. Okay, then that matter uh, Thank you. is Thank you. completed. I think we're finished with our agenda, right? Councilman, um, I just wanted to get clarification on item number eight, the PLA. I believe you, your intention was to approve it. Um, yes. You also said to adopt the CLA recommendations, but we just want to approve it. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Now you confuse me with the CLA recommendations. But uh, you you had mentioned. I think we're fine. Oh, you, you just wanted to approve the PLA, right? Right. <laughs> okay. okay. This meeting is adjourned. Um.